components of system farming and uh, this production uh, system, as you just mentioned, the Maya Milka. Then uh, the challenges uh, some system farming communities face today. And then we go into Minerva's part, uh, which is corn etymologies, language, and corn uh, farming, which is probably the most exciting about this uh, time of the day. Um, Let's get started here from the food systems uh, perspective. So the, the Mexican consumer has uh, access to two types of food here. Uh, one of them is uh, from uh, conventional hybrid or GMOs. It's produced like on a large uh, cropping system, cornfields, just, just, uh, just like the ones we have here in Montana as well. Um, goes through different, uh, de uh, different steps. Uh, from processing uh, to transportation, traders, and so on, and at the end uh, is uh, at the end is sold at, at retailers uh, uh, like uh, Walmart, for example, in Mexico. Um, uh, since uh, this uh, type of uh, corn receives a lot of subsidies from different parts, um, uh, this sort of deal can be purchased by uh, Mexican consumers at a very low price. A uh, problem with this uh, with the quality of this tortilla is that it is. Uh, calorie dense and micronutrient pool, so basically we nutrition. On the other hand, we have still a traditional farming in Mexico, where we have like traditional uh, uh, maize criollo land races, uh, so traditional corn varieties. We have uh, this uh, diverse uh, milk of post broken system uh, on small holo farms, subsistence subsist or other small farms. And uh, we have uh, the in independent places uh, where these today years are sold. Bakeries produce to deers, or they are produced in the bakeries themselves. And um, we are going to talk here about the left part of the screen. So I will uh, emphasize like the, uh, the land races and the, the only cropping system that the Senora is going to talk about uh, yeah, the, the food that comes out of the whole day. So um, corn for Mexico, that's essential, is diversity in many, many different ways. Let's get uh, at the very beginning at the genetics or at the diversity uh, of the plant uh, itself. So <coughs> corn or maize, as it is also called, called uh, what any name is uh, say maize, and it's uh, of the Boasi uh, family. Um, we don't know everything about its uh, genetic origin. We know that uh, this plant here, the Ocinta, plays a role in it. Uh, this plant, uh, plant uh, still exists uh, now. Commonly a, a wheat plant, uh, but uh, still exists in, in, the, in the Mesoamerican region. Um, and that's also where the center of origin of the corn lies. What we don't know uh, so exactly is what exactly happened in the process of domestication which, with which other crop or with, with which other plant it was grown to actually convert into the, into the corn we know today. But what we know is that when it happens, like 7,000 years before that, so 9,000 years ago, approximately, we already, already have like 9,000 years of corn uh, uh, which we can eat. Um, there's like two uh, theories about the uh, exact location where uh, corn comes from the lowland versus the uh, upland theory. So, the lowland theory places the origin of corn somewhere over there, so what is today Guatemala. Uh, but um, most researchers I uh, believe uh, in the upland the, uh, theory, so it comes from the from the Mexican highlands and the mountainous part, and that would be pr uh, probably here in the uh, what is now the state of Puebla in Mexico. That's probably where uh, corn comes from. So we are using this term landrace just to, to give you a background. So humanity began long ago, like with, uh, when the, when they settled, it became sedentary uh, with uh, the domestication of our first food plants. Uh, early farmers selected uh, different food plants for their specific traits. Um, and why did they select the plants? Basically, they, they wanted plants that uh, develop well in a specific environment where they were living and where they were seeding. And the other thing is, like, they were interested in specific traits, basically, like huge grains and specific tastes and so on and so forth. Now we can imagine that uh, if this happens over generations, and here we are talking like one farmer. His lifetime is probably 40, 50 years of seeding, and then we have hundreds of generations uh, after that. That with the time, these uh, these uh, corns become more and more diverse. Because one adapts to a drier climate, another one adapts to a uh, more humid climate, another one adapts to a, uh, this soil, and the other one to 
that soil, then people in some parts like uh, uh, white corn and in other parts maybe purple corn, at the end of the day, we end up with a huge uh, diversity. And this diversity that comes like from this traditional uh, breeding is what we call land races. And um, individual of plants of land races are usually very similar, but they are not uh, genetically so uh, uniform as our plants from conventional breeding, which we call varieties of cultivars. Uh, so the Mexican corn and land races are classified in seven groups based on their use, on their management, but also on their morphology, so on, their, on their appearance, what they look like. And uh, what also should be mentioned is the corn, and this, this, this generates, this is one of the reasons for the high diversity in, in corn land races, is that corn is an outbreeding species, and this means that it easily crosses like with other populations and other uh, varieties. Um, and that's what the seven Mexican land race groups look like. Uh, our first dom uh, domestic corn comes from this plant, the uh, and then we had to this, uh, the work of, of, the, of the past farmers, we have this tremendous um, uh, diversification in Mexico. We have uh, these uh, seven groups, and uh, uh, after the uh, colonization of uh, Mexico, obviously, was on then the base for the first hybrid, hybrid form. Um, this was uh, developed by an American researcher called George Harrison Shaw, and it basically gets back to this northern Highland group, but that's where all the corn, like the wheat combined the grocery store, basically comes from. Um, and now about the uh, production system. So the Maya Milba is one example of many different productions. So we are talking a lot about uh, uh, Yucatan and uh, the Mayas for two reasons. First, uh, first, first reason is that uh, I spent seven years there, so I, I, I know this area a little bit and, and more than uh, probably other parts of Mexico. The second reason is that it is the most homogeneous re region in Mexico where we still have subsistence of smallholder farmers and indigenous population. That's why the Maya Milpa is interesting, but it's far away from being like the only production system we have in, in Mexico that uh, involves corn. So um, most of the farmers in the central European and the Island, that's where they are. Yeah, that's, that's probably this area here. Yeah. So if you have ever been to Mexico, this would be right over there. And we are yeah, right, right there, so uh, more to the north. And uh, the Yucatan and Peninsula is already close like, to, to Guatemala and uh, Belize in the southeastern part of uh, Mexico. And yeah, most of the farmers there in the central Yucatan Peninsula, so on the coast you have fishery, and today a lot of tourism, but in the center you have these small farmers. And uh, they are uh, subsistent, um, which means that they basically grow for their own food and do not uh, primarily sell. Um, there, and that's all across Mexico, each uh, farming family of the community has access to common land. So each community has common land, the so-called Hido. And then uh, the farming families get like assigned like uh, different uh, lots where they can uh, where they can see the farm, but they are not there's no property. Um, and uh, what we should also should mention is that traditional farming in Mexico stands for much more than only getting food out of it. There's so much culture uh, connected to it. There's so much language, uh, much more sophisticated language than we have in English or in my mother tongue, uh, German or in, in, in Spanish. Yeah, this is really a sophisticated sophisticated language around agriculture, the, the Maya uh, language, and uh, Minerva will us tell more about the uh, linguistic aspects. Here's just a, an example, for example, this is a, a, a picture from a ceremony where the farmers call uh, the, the, the Mayan god uh, and to deliver rain for, uh, for the just uh, planted corn for having a good harvest. So what does, the, how is corn produced? And this is totally different from the way we do agriculture here in Montana. 
area of Montana, you drive across the state, you have this huge um, monocropping system, one single plant, sometimes hundreds, yeah, even thousands of acres with the same, exactly the same thing. Yeah, Milpa comes not from, does not come from a monocropping, but from a polycropping system. So it's always seeded the corn together with other plants. Usually we have two different uh, corn land races, a short cycle and a long cycle one. At the moment I will tell you more about that. Then we have one the June. On the Yukana Peninsula, it's the one lima bean. Um, uh, bean there. And uh, uh, in other parts of Mexico, you have like up there the common bean, you also use the same as bean. And then you have usually one a squash variety, so that's always like the center. You are probably familiar with the concept of the three sisters, and they are represented in these uh, body growing systems. But that's not all. Yeah? That's only like the base. Yeah, usually you have in a milk bar, pepper. You can have other vegetables. You can have medicinal plants, and also native flora all together. And that's what this uh, body growing system looks like. Here, just a snapshot. Uh, uh, from a case study we did some 10 years ago. Uh, so in this case, we surveyed all farmers of a specific community, it was like 100, and wanted to uh, assess like, the diversity of crops they have on the field. And as if you can see that, I think with one exception, everyone had this, obviously, these green milpa plants, and then there's a lot, a lot of other plants that can be, can be found on this. Um, on this plant, there's much more, that's one of like, the most common ones. Um, now getting back to these two corn varieties, yeah, that's really something interesting to reflect on why uh, do we have um, two different plants, two different corn plants. If my purpose is to harvest corn, why do I have two different varieties? So we have one shorter cycle one that can be harvested after two months, that's this one, and then we have the, the, the longer cycle one that can be harvested between like three or three and a half months after seed. Yeah, um, the reason um, is very simple, but makes a lot of sense. That's their insurance policy. So if we have a humid year, uh, the farmer has the big advantage that they can first harvest uh, the, the, the early corn, yeah, which usually has a lower, lower yield and lower quality, but it's something uh, they can harvest first. And then uh, after that, uh, they can harvest the other one. So they, they get like a double of production. But in the case of a drought, well, this one may not develop that well, but at least they have the, the, the lower yielding one for sure. That's a very smart strategy. And that's like their um, insurance policy against like uh, climate. This was long uh, developed long, uh, long before climate change, but it's obviously for our current owners also a very, very smart strategy. So uh, we have, we and, and, and Native American um, uh, farming communities also have this concept of the of the three, three sisters, especially in the southern United States. But I was called them the older three sisters because that's like the core part of it. But there's always more. And these three are like uh, ex uh, uh, the, the most outstanding one of the and those that are always represented. Yeah, and they work together very well. So um, what the is supposed to be a bean. So uh, what the bean does is that it uh, fixes a uh, nitrogen from the air, actually it's not the bean, but some bacteria that have in its roots, and uh, they, uh, this way they take fer fertilizer from the air. Yeah, that's what all uh, regimes actually do. Uh, and this uh, 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 extra nitrogen is then uh, uh, accessible or available for the other crops as well. Then we have the corn, and on the corn stalks, that's, that's where the where the beans can grow, so it sustains the legumes, whatever it is. Yeah, and then we have the squash, and the squash is the core function to cover the soil, and this is uh, to to avoid uh, evaporation of the water. So they play together very, very well, and that's not all. What is now interesting yeah, uh, of this mixture between corn, squash, and beans is that uh, these three uh, sisters. They grew up together. So we talk about co-evolution here. From the very, very beginning, um, corn was always seeded together with um, squash and with beans. And this means that when they are together, and we still don't know exactly how they work. We know that it works. There's, there's interesting studies 
uh, happening, but we don't know exactly why. It has something to do with the mood architecture. Yeah. When they are together, they fit together very well. And uh, there's very, very solid evidence that a single corn plant can produce up to 30% more yield if it's grown uh, together with uh, its, uh, its sisters, uh, uh, legumes and squash. And, uh, rather than the same variety of the same plant, what it produces like in a monoculture system. And this is what we call um, uh, overyielding. Yeah, this is an indicator that stands for overyielding, which is called length equivalent, equivalent ratio. And if this one is beyond one, it means the plants actually do more uh, when they are together in a monoculture system. And that's something really, really exciting. And that's a, these are exactly the things why I think we should be still interested in, uh, in traditional. Yeah, because I mean, which farmer here in Montana or, or anywhere else would, uh, would complain about additional yield uh, only because of growing plants uh, together? Um, so this diversity is, as mentioned, is, is an insurance, uh, obviously, to get, uh, the, uh, to get food out of the whole system, but it's also an insurance against pests and diseases. Yeah, so. Um, we know that our pests and diseases are like specialists, but they like to eat corn, they like to eat beans, or they like to eat squash. And I now have a field where they are all together, then obviously like their production rate is much lower because they do not only find like their favorite sort of food, but a lot of other different foods as well. Yeah? Uh, instead, if you compare it to our monocropping system, like the ones in Montana, well, that's a paradise for every pest. Yeah, because it's their favorite food and it's their favorite food only. Diversification reduces uh, the, the, the pressure of, uh, of pests and diseases, and it also provides diverse food. So if you think about what we get out of corn, squash, and beans all together is basically everything every we need for our nutrition. We have some vegetables, and we are done. Yeah, we have protein, we have carbs, we have uh, oil, we have uh, fiber, uh, we have minerals, everything we need, a very diverse diet can be based uh, on these three plants. What do the farmers do? So there's usually there's no irrigation systems. We should mention that this is like semi-tropical areas so with uh, rains a lot, like uh, uh, 1,200 millimeters is like the average uh, precipitation there. So uh, this can be managed with the rainfall only. And um, what they do, also like to fertilize the field, is they, uh, uh, they, do, they do slash growth. So slash and burn farming basically means that uh, in January they slash the trees and then in the summer, uh, prior to seeding, they burn them and then the, the ash that comes down there not only uh, is li are like uh, weeds and other, um, and other uh, bacteria and fungi that are killed by the fire and everything is cleaned up, it is also an excellent fertilizer for the plants. And uh, yeah, then this, they usually see it like in June, late June, early July, and then depending on the variety they have, uh, they happen between August and October. We should mention that uh, when I first saw what they are doing with burning the fields, I did not really like it, yeah, because to me the, the idea of, of burning our, our fields is a, is a crime to our soil. And, um, but if we understand, uh, that uh, with these heater systems where they only get uh, uh, specific uh, lots assigned throughout the year, that they only like seed on the same area every 20, 30, sometimes up to 50 years, I would say that this is a definitely a sustainable strategy. Uh, the, the problem about burning is when, is when we do it every year, yeah, such as some farmers here. Yeah, this is definitely uh, not good for your soil health, can cause erosion and uh, lots of other problems. Uh, um, also nutrients and so on. Uh, but uh, the Mayas actually, and these are all like words or, or terms from the Mayan language, have a very sophisticated language uh, that describes uh, the stages of succession. If an ecologist here, I know that succession is already an outdated model, but I think it still, uh, still gives an, an, an idea of how this all uh, works out and, and how the the, the people they are actually observing what, what's happening in their farm, how they're interested, how they have a turn on everything else. So I find that, I find this really interesting. But it's not all perfect there. So if you look at this uh, subsistence farming communities today, it's not only a story today, but probably of the past three decades, there are some challenges. 
challenge number one, climate change. So uh, the, uh, the rainfall, the precipitation there is decreasing. Yeah, there's less and less rainfall, but that's not the core problem. The core problem for the farmer, farmers, since they don't have irrigation systems, is that it's less and less predictable. Yeah, so uh, usually the new has some time around like end of June, early July, uh, we can see the corn or, or milk, but then now they don't know. Sometimes it should be earlier, sometimes it should be later. And uh, it's, it's definitely a, a, a problem there. Yeah, and uh, the other uh, thing that has happened is that the most water demanding of the three sisters are the beans. Yeah, so some of the farmers are now opting for milk or without beans, uh, squashing or corn. Okay. But if you remember, like the contributions that beans give to the whole system, uh, fertilizer for free they take from the atmosphere, then we see that the, subs the, the subsistence of the whole system obviously is affected by uh, climate change. I have here um, um, some um, a chart that represents like a this is a, a, a community right in the middle, uh, in the middle of the of the Yucatan Peninsula, and how uh, the precipitation has uh, changed there. We can see that usually most of the months it has decreased, but then we get now more uh, rainfall than usual um, in August uh, and uh, especially in September. And it's also a problem because too much rainfall can be, then be a problem with fungal diseases. So that's what uh, makes it all very difficult for them. Um, and there are studies out there like how like the three plants of the milk system are going to be affected by climate change in the reason. So uh, current models predict uh, that uh, this uh, the whole area will uh, convert from a uh, wet to a, uh, to a dry lowland uh, within the next uh, three decades. And uh, well, each of the plants obviously will uh, have um, will some consequences. So for corn, for example. Uh, we are expecting a per plant yield, yeah, because the, the increase of carbon in the air makes the plants produce more leaves, but we are not interested in, in the leaves, we are interested obviously in our uh, delicious corn. Yeah? Also the quality can be affected, and the content of micronutrients can be affected, and what we get out of it is like more more carbs, but that's not necessarily what we are looking for. Yeah? And, and as you can see here, squash and uh, the beans also will have um, be affected by climate change for sure. Um, and now we get out of the field and look at the whole food systems. And the problems don't stop on the field. Yeah, and that's something I've learned there. Yeah, that uh, um, some of the problems have to do something with, with nutrition, with perceptions, with demand, but in the first place with the economy and uh, with uh, policies. Yeah. So the farmers are now even in very very remote communities there on the Yucatan Peninsula. They are now competing with uh, food that is conventional, conventional grocery so ultra processed food. The same kind of food we get here in, in every grocery store. Yeah, and um, that's that's a problem because this food, thanks to uh, yeah, well all the all the money the big companies have, but also like to, to subsidies and so on, is sometimes uh, easier available and even cheaper for the people, and then they tend to buy like more of this. Uh, uh, commercial food, yeah, and uh, then uh, uh, a shop like this you can find basically on every corner in this community. And what you can get there is snacks and so on, and a lot of other stuff. Um, another thing is that this is something very uh, unique. The young people there, there's their studies about us, they don't like the squash anymore. So they, they eat the squash in a very, very different presentation to people to next year uh, a presentation about squash as well because also very interesting. So they make use from the seeds uh, uh, to the to the fruit itself and the young people they don't like it uh, anymore so they, uh, they have this uh, delicious uh, foods. This one is called uh, uh, Brasso de Reina which, uh, which includes both uh, like, uh, pumpkin or squash seeds and corn of course. Yeah, so this is less and less available now and uh, obviously this also affects like the diversity of the fields because why should the farmers see plants if they, the people don't want to eat them? Um, and then uh, we have another problem and this is uh, an aging rural uh, community and there I, th I, s I think I see a, a huge parallel with, with Montana where we have exactly the, the same situation in our rural communities. 
So um, many young people decide to work in the very close uh, mass tourism areas of the so-called Riviera Maya, which includes Cancun and Maya del Carmen and all these places. Um, this absorbs a lot, a lot, a lot of young workers that now decide to, to work there and, uh, and to get like a, you know, a regular paycheck, it's not much money, but uh, uh, they, they prefer this, this lifestyle. In a, a 2011 case study, the same one that uh, we just presented, uh, the diversity of the fields, we found that in this community, uh, over 90% of the farmers are older than 40, and I think like two thirds were older than 60. So the farmers are getting uh, older and older and older, and, um, um, and the kids are working basically uh, for tourism. Yeah, and only 3% percent, percent, uh, want to continue on, on the mill, but in the field, and most of them uh, prefer to work somewhere else. Yeah, and this affects something very important. This is the traditional ecolo ecological knowledge, knowledge transfer. So operating a mill but is not, is everything but easy. Yeah, operating a mill but requires a lot, a lot of knowledge. How, how you do the slash and burn, and how, how you put like all the seeds together. Um, yeah, even like when they are seeding and they are doing some sophisticated circles, this is all, all very, very well thought through. And uh, it needs teaching, yeah? It's not like formal teaching, but the, the, the children usually see this from their father, you know, their, their, their parents doing this. And um, that's, uh, that's definitely something uh, that, is, that is getting lost if we have more and more young people who are, are, are migrating out of this, uh, these communities. Uh, a very uh, recent pheno phenomenon is now um, happening. This was, this was really interesting. Uh, not during COVID-19, so starting in 2020, uh, tourists, uh, tourists did not come in to Peru. Yeah, so thousands and ten thousands of uh, tourist workers lost their jobs. What did they do? They returned to their community. Problem was, they did not know to, they did not know how to operate the mitbas. Yeah, and, and uh, the, you know, um, uh, Mexicans are usually very fast in inventing great creative nicknames, and they call them. Los inutiles, the useless. Yeah, because they were there, they could carry some sex or some something, but for, like for the sophisticated people, but they were not qualified anymore. Yeah, and now it uh, looks like everyone is happy that they are returning to Cancun again. Yeah, so that's definitely a problem. And that shows us that this, the knowledge that is behind these sophisticated farming systems is, is getting definitely lost. Um, and uh, these, are, these are like some quotes of interviews uh, we did there, um, the, the, the farmers are totally aware of it. Yeah, so uh, one farmer said, for example, yeah, you need to know when to see, when to slash, everything. That there's, there's a lot of knowledge and there's a lot of observation behind managing a farm system like this. Yeah, and yeah, people don't know it. Yeah, and uh, what they want is they want a lot of stuff like everyone. And uh, obviously, for some, this may even cause them then to join gangs and, and, and criminal organizations, many of them also migrate uh, or to the UK or some some go here to the United States. Yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of uh, cherry pickers here in, in, in Montana. They, uh, some of them come from Mexico, Central America. And I'm sure there's a lot from, from the Peninsula. Peninsula. So that's uh, that's what's happening uh, in these communities. But the strange thing is, yeah, there's this ambiguity that. Um, at the same time, what do the, fa the farmers complain about the young people, uh, uh, their kids, or the young people leaving, but for their own children, they want them to leave. Yeah, they say they should have a better life, yeah, uh, they should go to school, uh, well, everything we are doing here in the MSU too, so they want, they want this life for their kids, but at the same time, they are complaining about the young people. Yeah, so that's, that's how, how uh, humans uh, work from time. Um, getting more into politics, so this Aikido system I, I, I talked about, uh, this Aikido system where we have um, like the, the land distributed um, and um, commonly owned but then operated like by, uh, some laws by specific farmers, there's a lot of political pressure. 
problem depends very well, depends a lot on like how fertile the area is. This can be bigger farmers from Mexico, this can be, can be Mexican companies, but this is also uh, the international players who are interested in this land because there's a lot, a lot of water below. Brown uh, water is no problem at all on, on the European Peninsula. Um, and as mentioned, this uh, then causes like an increasing area available for this session. Um, this all creates, this is now a, 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 a very complex, but at the same time, the very obvious, vicious uh, cycle yeah, that gets farmers out of subsistence farming. Yeah. So, operating in Milba is very sustainable. It's a nice job, but it's a lot of physical work. Yeah. They have no farming machines, no tractors. This is all done by hand. And the traditional Mexican family, they have six, six, seven, up to ten children usually. And when they were all working on the field, then uh, this uh, the hard work would be done. Yeah. Now with more and more children leaving, what happens? Yeah. Uh, they need uh, to uh, pay the farm workers to help. Yeah. And therefore, they need money. Yeah. And in the, in the subsistence farming system, the demand for money is relatively low because. There's some exchange, but most of the food they need, and also like the, the, the medicine is produced on other farms themselves. But now they need money to pay for this farm. In order to get this money, they have different possibilities. One uh, possibility is to apply for subsidies. Yeah, Mexican, the Mexican version of the USDA, they are not very interested in their small farmers, but there are some problems. Yeah, the problem is. If you want to apply for money, you need money, yeah, because this is a very corrupt system. So at the at the very beginning, you need to pay someone so that they actually look at your at your application. So you there's an other need for having more, money, yeah. And what do the farmers do as a response? Well, they uh, they do increased off farm activities. So some of them are almost converting like into part-time farmers. They work on construction or whatever they can find, or sometimes they they sell food. But uh, what this all means is, is an additional income, but at the same time, less money or less time available for operating the farms. Um, and this means at the same time, the farms need to be more effective. Yeah? So this means that they need to intensify the production. I'll come to this in a moment. Then obviously they have the possibility to sell the land now with the new laws yeah, that, that are ending the legal system. And they have now the, the right to sell it. It's another income, yeah? but the outcomes of this are really horrible. So I've seen, but not one, but at least 15, 20 farmers in one single community who, who ended up in, in poverty only. Yeah? Because what they are doing is they get a, well, quite a bit of money for their land. And what they are doing is spend it on, on, on alcohol, basically. And it's done in two years. And then they have nothing left. Yeah? That's, that's what's happening. Um, what they also can do, another strategy for them is they can start selling parts of their house. But this is also some problems, yeah. Because then I need a, I need additional parts of my uh, of my money to spend it on food that I need to buy. Because if I sell part of the corn, and usually what the family could use like the, uh, the the what they get out of the harvest, like for a whole year, if they start uh, selling it, then they need to buy additional food, and what they need is more money. So what what some of the farmers are doing to compensate for all this is to intensify production, to get more heat out of the system. And therefore, they now uh, uh, use commercial seeds, uh, they use our uh, fertilizers, the synthetic fertilizers, they use pesticides to make it all more productive. Yeah? Uh, but this, this stuff also costs again money and they need more. Uh, the other thing is, when they start selling their harvest, they cannot use, uh, they cannot use their uh, traditional land, land races anymore, the, the ones we saw at the, at the very beginning. Why? Because for industrial use of the uh, tortilla flour, the machines are not prepared for these land races. They want our standard, standardized year of corn, and the farmers start seeding this corn. But this corn then needs more fertilizers, yeah, because it's it's developed, basically they are developed in Michigan or somewhere in, in, the, in the Midwest, and they are developed for this climate and this soil. So if I start, uh, start seeding, uh, commercial seed, I need more pesticides, and then again I need more money. And um, therefore I will send more kids to Cancun, 
and again the whole uh, circle starts all around. Yeah. It's still there. Yeah, it still exists in the year 2022, but, uh, 2022, but I don't know whether we, uh, we could make the same presentation in, in 20 years from now. So it, it's definitely something to think about. However, and now we come to, to the good part of the story, corn is still there. Uh, corn can be uh, consumed in very, very uh, diverse ways, and there's a, a, there's a huge connection to the, to the indigenous languages, and here it's better I, I stop uh, talking because we have an expert here. This is Hi. Um, well, despite of all the problems, that Roland has mentioned, um, corn is still a really important ingredient in all the Mexican food. And uh, the part of the presentation that is on me, we are going to focus on some etymologies of words related to corn. And of course, we are going to talk about Mexican food. So I apologize if I make you hungry along the presentation. And a lot of time, corn has received many names depending on the type of corn, depending on the stage of growing, depending on the way that we prepare the, the corn. And of course, the different parts of the plant also receive different names. Let's begin with the word milpa that Roland has been using a lot. And milpa comes from Nahuatl, and Nahuatl is the language that was spoken by Aztecs, and they settled down in the central part of Mexico, but they had impact in all the Mexican territory. They were a powerful, a powerful group. And uh, from Nahuatl, we get this word mili, that means cultivated land, and pa, that is a suffix that means on. Now, I know that Roland has been talking about milpa as this uh, mix of uh, crops that we uh, use, but for me, as a normal, regular citizen that knows nothing about agronomy, if you uh, use the word milpa, for me, it refers only to the corn field. I know that uh, in some other parts, they uh, combine different uh, crops, but milpa, for a regular Mexican that knows nothing about agronomy, the most important crop is corn. And there are many toponyms that include the root mili in the names. A toponym is uh, the name of a place. And we have the first one, Milpa Alta, is a municipality in Mexico City. And if you can see in the shield of the municipality, there is this picture uh, of, a, of a man, it's not a man, it's a god, and it's the god of corn, and it has a corn plant in the representation. So even though milpa uh, refers to these polycropings uh, from ancient times, the most important one is corn. And we have also different uh, small towns in the central part of Mexico that receive the name from this wood, like Miltepec, Miltengo, or Milpillas, and there are many more. The next word that we are going to analyze is Mazorca. And Mazorca is uh, the cob of the, of the corn. Uh, this word comes from Arabic, that means spare stick. And it, it is a perfect example of how a word can be transferred to different meanings for visual uh, similarity. So, the meaning of spare stick was in Arabic. The Arabians gave the word to Spaniards, and Spaniards gave the word to Mexicans. And now, we can see the similarity of this. Uh, originally, it was used to refer to the balusters of balconies, and because of visual similarity, it was also used for wool, or linen thread that was wound around the spindle, and it has this figure. And if you remember, the cord, well, it has the same form. So now if you look up for the word in the, in the dictionary, mazorca, you will find a definition for corn. It's the type of fruit that has several um, grains in line, and that is what we use for mazorca. But because we are very inventive in Mexico, we also use it, the word, like when you say the expression, pelar la mazorca, that means when you smile and you show your teeth. <laughs> so, the next word is 
Elote, and we go back to Nahuatl, and the word in Nahuatl is Elotl, and it's very similar to the word that we Hispanicize this, this word to Elote. Um, the elote, as, a, as opposed to the, to the mazorca, is when the cup has the grains tender. So if you squeeze them, they squeeze a little bit. So there, there is a difference in these two words. Elote is the tender corn, and mazorca is once the corn is dry. So it is not tender anymore. And when it's dry and you toast it, it pops like, like a popcorn. And then the Nahuatls gave this uh, different corn the name Skittle, that now we use as Esquite. And these two are part of the Mexican cuisine. And if you go to Mexico, in any part of Mexico, you will find street stands where elotes and esquites are sold. So elotes are boiled. And if you can see, there are different uh, varieties of corn. It doesn't matter, you boil it and then you put some mayo or uh, cream, then some cheese, and they will ask you, would you like it with chile del que pica or del que no pica? So uh, that means, would you like it with a spicy chili or not a spicy chili? But don't be deceived, both are spicy. <laughs> and the skittles are the same. Now they are prepared not with the dry corn, still with the tender one. And they boil the corn um, with some butter, or sometimes they fry it with some uh, condiments like onion or epazote, and then they put it in a in a glass, and they ask you again, like if you want mayo, cheese, and chili. The next word is olote, and it's very similar to elote, but it's different. Now, olote also comes from Nahuatl, and it means uh, the heart of the corn, olote and we say olote, now that we Hispanicize the word. And today, uh, uh, the heart of the corn, uh, it, it, it is the cough, but without the grains. So when I was trying to look for a um, translation for these words, mazorca, elote, and olote, uh, in English, it is the same word, cough. But we refer to it in different ways, depending if it is tender, if it is dry, or if it is just the heart of the corn without the grains. And we use this part of the corn as forage or fuel. And then we have this thing that is, I don't know if it is part of the corn, but we call it cuitlacoche. Some people refer to it as the Mexican truffles. And the cuitlacoche or huitlacoche is a fungus that parasites the corn. And farmers need to be really specialized in detecting which one is edible and which one is not, because there are many fungus that parasite the corn, but this one specifically is really, really tasty. It comes from cuitlatu, that means excrement, and kochi, to sleep. And if you look at it, and you know the origin of the word, maybe you won't be like very inspired to eat it, but when they say that it comes from Quitlatum, that means excrement, what they refer to is was it was the excrement of God. So it was a privilege to eat it. And at the beginning, it was not a food that everybody could eat, but only the people in the high hierarchy of government. And Kochi to sleep is because there is not an agreement on the origin of the word. So some say that it, it was Quitlatum uh, because of the excrement of gods. And some say that it comes from Kochi because there was this bird that used to live in the cornfield and used to sleep there, and that's where the uh, fungus got its name. But actually, it's really, really interesting if you ever go to my team. I've never seen it here. And um, if you have the opportunity to, to try it, you will find it really interesting. The, the taste is very distinctive. And then we get the word corn, uh, maize. But actually, I was thinking, and when I was doing this research to do the presentation, I was surprised that maize didn't come from Nahuatl or any other uh, native Mexican language. It comes from Taino. And Taino is a language that is spoken, I hope that I can pronounce this, okay, from the Antilles, is that the word? Um, like Puerto 
Rico and all these places. And it means what sustains life. And actually, that cannot be more accurate for Mexicans. Maíz is what sustains Mexican lives. Uh, in other Mexican native languages, corn was referred to as sunuku in the Tarahumara language that is spoken up north. Most of these languages are still spoken by really small communities, but they still use this word. So sunuku is in Tarahumara, in Chihuahua, that is the north part. In the south, Chiapas, Tabasco, and the Yucatan Peninsula, they have a similar word, but in different dialects, like Tzetzal, Tzotzil, and Chontal, and also the Maya, they have a similar word for maíz, that is Ishim, or Ishim. In Purépecha, that is in the central part of Mexico, they call it Tziri. And in Tlahuica, that is also very close to Mexico City, is Tuwi. So if you notice, they uh, name corn in very different ways. And the Nahuatl gave corn the name Tlaoli. <coughs> and Tlaoli or Senti are the main names uh, of uh, corn in Nahuatl. So Tlaoli comes in turn from another root that is Tlaoli, that means to shell the corn. And Tlaoli was used to refer to the dried grains. Sentli was used to refer to the whole plant. And if you remember the shield of the municipality in Mexico City, Milpa Alta, the name of the god is Senteotl, uh, that comes from Sentli, that means corn, and Teotl, that means deity or god. So, Tlaoli was corn only to refer to the dried grains, and Sentli to the whole plant, the corn. From this root Tlaoli, or Tlaiolali, we have different words that uh, are formed to refer to something related to corn. Tla Tlaoyoloyal is the place where the corn is shelled, and you, actually there are some communities where they still use these words. Tlausentlayan is the place to store the grains. Tlacoyani is a person who shells the corn. And or Tlaoltakak is to transport the corn. And all of them have the same root, Tlaoli. Now, the only word that you will listen to in uh, Mexico referring to food is Tlacoyo. That if you notice, it's very similar to Tlacoyani. And that Tlacoyo is like a thick tortilla that is stuffed with beans, fava beans, or reggaeton, and then you, you grate it, and on top you can put some uh, cactus salad, cheese, and of course, salsa. And it's my favorite. It's really, really yummy. So, uh, we have all these different parts of the corn, and now we are going to talk about the process to eat the corn in different ways. And that is called nixtamal, nixtamal or nixtamalización. Uh, and you've probably heard of it. So, to make the uh, corn edible, it needs to be processed. And in the process, there are two main steps. One is to peel the corn, and the second one is to uh, grind the grains. To peel the grains, they need to be boiled in water with lime. And this process gets the name from the original speakers at Nahuatl. It was called Nixcome. Nextati means the lime that is used to do the nixtamalization, and comito is the pot that you use to do the process. So you boil it, and uh, once you boil it, then it's not called tlaoli anymore, it's called nextamali. Again from Nahuatl, nextati that means lime, and tamali that is a kind of paste. And that must sound familiar to you, tamali, a kind of paste, and it's what we eat as tamales. And then you grain, you grind the grains. So the process is this, you shell the grains, you combine it with water and lime, boil it, you leave it overnight, then you drain the water and you grind it. And to grind it, uh, this was the ancient process. There were some women 
on the floor with this artifact that is called metate, and they grind the, the, the corn in this way. Uh, there are still some women who do, the, who do uh, there are still some women who do this, but most uh, like commercial tortillas and tamales and everything, they use uh, modern uh, machines to grind the corn. So once we have the mixed tamal that is nextati, wine, and tamale, the kind of dough, we get this corn dough, and we prepare different foods um, from this dough. So we have tamale, that is a kind of dough, so we prepare tamales. Pinoli is the corn flour, and we call it pinole. Atoli, that comes from atol, water, and toloa, to swallow. Uh, and we prefer something that is called atole. If you notice, we keep the words and we just change the ending for pronunciation because we don't have these endings in, in Mexican Spanish anymore, but the words are very, very similar. Pozoato or pozoli, that comes from pozo, that means something foamy, or uh, pozomi, that, that means to boil. And tlaxcali, that is the Nahuatl word for tortilla. So we can prepare all of this with mixed tamal, with the corn dough once, once it is mixed tamalized. And then we have the tamales. And the tamales vary in every region of Mexico, depending on uh, the state that you visit, you will find different types of tamales. For me, all of them are tasty. Roland disagrees. He doesn't like the Yucatan Peninsula tamales, but the ones in Central Mexico, when I told him like we eat them, in a torta that is like a sandwich, he looked at me like, are you crazy, the tamal is already a dough, and you put it in, a, in two pieces of bread and then you eat it, I was like, but it's delicious. And he ended up two, uh, what do we call those? Uh, it's not the colote, it's, um, I forgot the name. But he ended up eating two of them. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the type of tamal uh, changes depending if it is uh, wrapped in corn husk or in banana leaves or even in the leaves of the corn plant, we have different tamales. So this is my favorite one. It's called tamal de ollita. And how to make them is a really well-kept secret because I've never known how to do that. If you notice, it's a hollow tamal. So when you cut it, all the salsa that is inside flows to your dish, and then you find the meat and everything. But it's very little dough, and then the rest is salsa. So it's very spicy, and it's really good. The tamal chapaneco is wrapped in banana leaves. And I, I decided to, to choose this picture because it's really interesting. Instead of meat, it opts for some egg, olives and sometimes they even include um, these prunes so it's a combination of taste it's salty it's sweet and at the same time spicy the corundas are the ones uh, that are wrapped in the leaves of the corn and then you cook it just the dough and when you are going to eat it then you include the meat and the salsa and you decide how much you want on it, but huh? oh yeah, the torta, the tamal, the, the sandwich of tamal is called guajolota. That's correct. <laughs> we also have a sweet version of tamales, and the original ones had only uh, sugar and raisins. But now, if you go to Mexico City and uh, all the states around it, you will find tamales with some fruit like guava or pineapple, coconut, and also you will find tamales with Nutella and chocolate, you name it. We are very creative with this. <laughs> and Uchepos, the distinctive thing of Uchepos, that they are original from Michoacán, that is also a central state, is that they use the fresh corn husk to wrap the tamal, and it gives a different flavor to it. Usually they are sweet too. Then we have the pinole. And the pinole, if you remember, pinole means corn flour. And then you have the dried grains. You don't mix tamalize them. You just toast them, and then you grind them. 
you can combine them with cinnamon and sugar, and then you have this powder that we use to prepare some beverages, or just eat the powder like that. There is a saying in Mexico that, uh, that goes like this. El que tiene más saliva come más pinole. And that means like if you have a lot of saliva, you will be able to eat a lot of this. And you cannot eat this and at the same time whistle. So there are different things related <laughs> to this word, but it's actually very, um, uh, it gives you a lot of energy, energizing, that is a word. It's very energizing if you don't have the time to have breakfast or something, you just grab a little bit of pinoli and you eat it along the day or you prepare some drinks with it. And we have the atolis or atoli, that is a drink, uh, uh, a beverage. So the most popular atolis, some of them still exist, some of them I'm not sure, I've never seen them, but uh, I don't know the whole Mexican Republic, so maybe somewhere there they still have this. So we have the chile atoli or atol chili, that is a spicy atoli. That is the one that I have tried and it's really, really good. The Nikwatoli is a sacred atoli, but it's not a beverage anymore. Now, if you look for Nikwatoli, you will find that it's like a, a dessert, that is like a custard, like a jello, and it's um, solidified, it's not a liquid anymore. The Chilatoli or Chilnequatoli, that is spicy and sweetened with honey, so it's spicy, salty, and sweet. The Aski Atoli, it's a tolly with the skites, and we, we speak, we've seen that the skites are the grains of the tender corn. And the ayucolia tolly is a tolly mixed with mashed beans. Ayucote is a type of bean that is huge, it's big, and it's white. And now it's very typical for Christmas. So, we have this atole de masa and guava. When you boil the corn, the corn dough, you mix it with sugar, cinnamon, and you can add some fruit, like guavas, and it's the most popular one, and it's really, really good. So if you go to a stand of tamales, they will always combine the tamales with some atole, and they will sell either an atole with fruits, with chocolate, or with rice. We have the chile atole, and this is one way to eat it. So you boil the, the corn dough and you mix it with some sp uh, uh, spices, of course the chili, and this herb that is called epazote, and it's very typical of Mexican dishes. The nicuatole, as I told you, is not a beverage anymore. It's more like a custard, like a dessert, and you can also mix it with some fruit uh, to eat it. The pozoatos are foamy or boiled. So the, those are the presentations of these uh, dishes. And the pozoatos are not exclusively made from corn. Sometimes you have the cocoa beans and you mix them with water, you boil them, and you get a beverage that is called chocolate. And that may sound familiar to you because it's the chocolate. The original chocolate in Mexico was not uh, was not drunk with uh, milk, but only water. And now, if you mix this chocolate with the corn dough, you get something that is called cacao apinoli, or in modern Mexican, uh, chocolate. Some pozoatos are sweet, and some are salty. In the Yucatan Peninsula, because it's very, very hot, they drink something that is called pozol, and it's very refreshing. Then they don't boil it, they just have the pinoli, that is the corn flour, and they mix it with water, and sometimes with chocolate, so you get this beverage, and they combine it several times so it gets foamy, and they sell it in the streets, and it's really, really refreshing. So there is this version of pozol with chocolate, but there is this other version of pozole that <coughs> does not include the chocolate, and it's eaten with corn, just like that, and it's really energizing too. And here we have the cacao pinoli, uh, that it comes from cacao and the pinoli, 
or they call it also champurrado. And the modern champurrados, of course, include some milk. But they are still foamy. And the pozole, it's, um, it's not exactly a beverage, it's a whole dish. It includes the, uh, the corn that is boiled, and you can have the version with chicken or with pork, and then you put a whole salad on top because you include lettuce, radishes, onions, some oregano, and it's really, really good. And we have the tlaxcali, that is the last dish that they prepare with the corn dough, with the nixtamal, and it's the word that the Nahuatls gave to tortillas. Now, the word tortilla comes from the Spaniards, and actually, it comes from the word torta. A torta, it's a dough for bread that is similar, uh, for bread or similar, sorry, that is circular, flat, and <coughs> cooked slowly. That is a torta for the Spanish people. And because uh, when they came to Mexico and they saw the tortillas, they said, oh, it's like a little cake. So the suffix illa, it's like a diminutive, and they call it tortilla. So the word that we use for this is from Spanish, and the word from Nahuatl is Tlaxcali. And from ancient times, they mix the, the tortillas with different ingredients. So we have a variety of tortillas. And one of them was the, uh, the name is this, Huautlacuali, that is a huge tortilla that was mixed with different ingredients, like the Huautlacuali, that is the red corn, and they also mix it with a flower from an orchid that was the Quatzontecosochitl. I'm sorry, but these words are so difficult to pronounce. Quatzontecosochitl, and Xochitl means flower. Uh, so they combined these ingredients and they were uh, to prepare some tortillas for the Tlatuanis, and the Tlatuanis were the governors of the tribes. From this root, Tlaxcali, the only dish that we have that still gives the root is the Tlayuda. So if you ever visited Oaxaca, you will have seen these huge tortillas. They are very thin, and um, they put some beans, some cheese, and salsa, of course, and then you can have them as breakfast. So for this one, you have the whole food for the, for the whole day. And of course, if we talk about corn, we cannot skip the word taco. And the origin of this word is very vague. Um, there is not a consensus on uh, what is the exact origin of the word taco. But some say that it comes from Nahuatl, placo, that uh, refers in the middle to, to something that is in the middle. And it makes sense, like for tacos, you put the food in the middle. But some people say, like, no, 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 no. It has nothing to do with placo. It comes from the roots black or plax, if you remember Tlaxcali, that is the name for tortillas, it refers to corn. And there are so many other words that have this root. Um, plax is related to corn or the act of eating. Now if you notice here, uh, Nahuatl's consider eating hand in hand with corn. They cannot conceive a meal without corn. So we have the Cuautlacuali, that is a white big tortilla eaten by the Tlatuanis. The tlacualitzli, that is the word to eat or for food. Tlacualispan is the time to eat. And tlacuali, that is a dish, a delicacy, food, or anything that can be eaten. You can use this word for that. And we have different types of tacos. This one maybe is the most, um, the most popular one around the world. And it's the tortillas. You put the meat or the food in, in the middle. And then you put some onions, cilantro, of course, uh, the lime, and salsa. And these ones, this picture is of some tacos. Um, tacos. Oh my god, I'm not Mexican anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's not so little. What, what do you call it? Uh, uh, al pastor. Al pastor, yeah. Tacos al pastor, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> These ones are very popular in Mexico City and they are steamed tacos. And even though they are steamed, 
they are very greasy, but they are delicious. They use these small tortillas, and they put little food in, in the middle, then they fry them, and they uh, collect them in a basket. The basket is covered with some plastic and some pieces of cloth, and they go in the streets like selling the tacos, so they, the, the plastic helps to steam them and to keep them hot. And then you can have like 20 of them because they are really, really small and the content is very little, but they are delicious. And they usually have the best salsas ever in Mexico City. We also have the taco dorado or flautas, and this is all rolled over and deep fried. And then on top you can put sour cream, cheese, salsa, and everything. There is um, this comedian in Mexico that was explaining Mexican food, and she was always saying like, if you want to know what taco is, well, taco is a tortilla with some meat, and then you can put a salsa, cheese, and onions. But if you want to know what an enchilada is, well, they are tortillas, and then you put some meat, and then you put some salsa, and sour cream, and cheese. And if you want to know what a tlacoyo is, well, that is a tortilla with some meat, it's the same. Everything is the same, but the presentation is different, and it receives different names. So we have the taco dorado, and they are deep fried, so they are very crunchy, and you can have a variety of stuffing for them. And the tacos ahogados is just the same as a flauta, but you put lots of salsa, so it seems that they are drowning. So ahogado means that, that they are drowning in salsa. And just to finish, I put the recipe for something that um, uh, it's also popular in Mexico, and especially among people who cannot eat um, gluten, and they have corn cookies. So you use some lard or vegetable shortening, sugar, corn flour, corn starch, orange extract or vanilla extract if you prefer so, some cinnamon, an egg, baking powder, a pinch of salt, and then you mix the ingredients and bake them. And you must excuse me because I forgot to put the picture, but we have some corn cookies for you to try. So they are diet free, gluten free, and you can have a try of Mexican food. Let's see if you like it.